Welcome to Fireside Polysynthesis for Novices, Part 2. We'll be looking at free word order, how polysynthesis arises, and where to go from here. Let's begin. One consequence of the fact that so much information about an event and its participants is encoded onto the verb in polysynthetic languages is that word order can be much more fluid than in languages like English, where word order is needed to distinguish subjects from objects. By no means do all polysynthetic languages have free word order. However, they are more likely to have freer word order than a more analytic language of the English type. In most cases in languages with relatively free word order possibilities, the actual order in a given sentence would be determined primarily by factors such as the discourse prominence of various participants, a desire to emphasize or background a particular event, etc. In general, Newly introduced characters or topics will be expressed with nouns placed near the beginning of the sentence, while old, established characters or topics will be expressed with nouns towards the end of a sentence, though, of course, this varies depending on the language and the precise nuances needed, and so on. Some languages go even further than this, and have completely free word order. The order of elements is determined solely by the current discourse needs. Such languages are known as non-configurational. There's a few characteristics that tend to go with non-configurationality, including extensively omitting noun phrases and discontinuous phrases. I'll discuss them, albeit only briefly. Omitting noun phrases. This is an extension of a property many of you will be familiar with from standard European languages, termed prodrop. In these languages, like Spanish for instance, where the verbs are inflected to mark their subject, subject pronouns are rarely used in neutral sentences. This is possible because the subject is already marked with a verb affix, so no additional specification of the subject is needed to make the utterance intelligible. So, in Spanish, the normal way of saying I'm singing is canto. In the prodrop languages, when they appear, pronouns tend to be used for an emphatic purpose. Yo canto generally means something equivalent to the English of I'm singing, not you, Leonard, with emphatic stress. Non-configurational type polysynthetic languages, then, extend this pattern in two ways. First, since they mark both subject and object on the verb, there's no need to express either with overt pronouns. But secondly, they frequently drop entire noun phrases, not just pronouns. Even in mildly configurational polysynthetic languages, like Ojibwe, it's very rare for both the subject and the object of a verb to be expressed with a full noun phrase discontinuous phrases. Also called discontinuous constituents, this refers to the property whereby the individual elements of a phrase, say the demonstrative and noun of a noun phrase, do not need to occur next to one another. I'll provide a couple of examples from Ojibwe. One final note about non-configurationality or free word order languages. While many polysynthetic languages have these characteristics, many non-configurational or free word order languages are not polysynthetic. For instance, non-configurationality was first pointed out in Walpiri, a non-polysynthetic Australian language, as in this example. And here's another example of a discontinuous phrase in a non-polysynthetic Australian language, Wambaya. Right, we've covered a number of the basic traits that polysynthetic languages tend to have which should hopefully help with creating your own. But I suspect many of you are considering developing a polysynthetic conlang out of a non-polysynthetic conlang that you already have, or perhaps a future descendant from some non-polysynthetic natural language. A natural question, then, is what are some pathways by which polysynthesis can develop? I won't cover all the possibilities here, just a few in roughly the same order as the traits of polysynthetic languages we've discussed. Before getting into the discussion, though, it's important to know the basics of what grammaticalization is. Grammaticalization is the evolution of formerly independent words into grammatical markers, often clitics or affixes. During the process of grammaticalization, two things tend to happen. The first is phonological reduction or erosion of the word clitic or affix, which is often irregular. And the second is semantic bleaching where much of the specific meaning of the original word is lost as it comes to indicate broader grammatical relationships instead. I'll give a classic example from English to demonstrate the basic ideas involved. 
Originally, the expression going to only had one meaning, the literal sense of being in motion towards a goal. So, I'm going to meet with him meant quite literally, I'm on my way to meet him. It's easy to see, though, the connection this sense has with an intentive or future sense. If I'm on my way to meet someone, presumably I will actually be meeting him soon in the future. So, going to began to become grammaticalized into a marker of future tense, and now the normal interpretation of I'm going to meet him is the same as I will meet him. We can see this process of semantic bleaching. Going to no longer has a full lexical meaning in this use, but rather expresses the grammatical category of future tense. We can also see phonological reduction. In normal speech, going to, in its future sense, is rarely pronounced as two words, but rather as something more like gonna. Similar processes of grammaticalization have operated many times in English. For instance, the other common future form, the clitic u, comes from will, which originally meant want to, and in languages throughout the world. It is grammaticalization that can help to create new affixes, and thus greater synthesis, as we will see in the coming sections. Polypersonal marking. The pathway by which polypersonal marking on verbs develops is quite straightforward. Through grammaticalization, independent pronouns become cliticized with the verb root and eventually become inseparable affixes, often with some phonological reduction from their earlier form. Various Romance languages actually offer good examples of this. Most Romance languages continue the Latin system of already marking the subject with an inflection on the verb. However, Romance languages also mark objects on the verb as well using pronominal clitics, though the placement of these clitics varies from language to language and depending on the exact situation. Some examples from Spanish can help demonstrate this. No me lo digas. Here, the subject is marked with the verb suffix as, as usual in Romance, and both the indirect object me and the direct object lo are indicated with clitics that are attached to the beginning of the verb. Ayer la vi. Here again, the verb is inflected to mark the subject, and the direct object la is marked with a clitic proposed to the verb. Damelo. Once again, the verb inflects to mark its subject and the objects are marked with clitics, though in this case they follow the verb, and by Spanish spelling convention are written as one word. In fact, in a number of Spanish dialects, these clitics are well on the way to becoming obligatory person markers, in that they often co-occur with a co-referent full noun phrase, as in San Salvadorian Spanish, ya los lee los libros. Note that many of these object pronouns are reduced versions of the full pronouns of Latin, Thus, lo is an example from the Latin illum, which has irregularly lost its initial vowel in the process of grammaticalization into an unstressed clitic. Note also that unlike in Latin, these Romance object clitic pronouns cannot freely occur in many different positions. Instead, there are a limited number of places within the clause where they can occur, generally either directly before or directly following the verb. This is another indication that they have become grammaticalized and are no longer completely independent pronouns, but rather are partly on the way to becoming verbal affixes marking person. Many Romance languages, thus, are a good demonstration of the beginning stages of the creation of polypersonal marking. In fact, one Romance language is well known for having already developed true polypersonal marking, and is sometimes called polysynthetic. French as an aside, I wouldn't call French polysynthetic, even despite the vagueness of the term, because French doesn't yet show the other features we've touched on, like noun incorporation and multifarious affixes. In its evolution from Latin, French has undergone a number of phonological reductions, which have ultimately resulted in the French verb no longer effectively inflecting to mark the person of its subject, as other Romance languages are capable of. There's a Wikipedia article you can check out called The Phonological History of French. As a result, French makes much more frequent use of personal pronouns than other Romance languages, but in unmarked contexts, these pronouns, in fact, have become fused to the verb, both phonologically and morphosyntactically. Though they are still sometimes written as separate pronouns in the standard orthography, there are arguments for considering them true verbal affixes marking person. Take the French sentence, je vais le lui donner, I'm going to give it to him or her. Though written as several separate words, this phonologically is a single word, 
Je vais lui donner. There are also syntactic criteria for considering this a single word, though I'm not going to get into them here. The point is not to prove whether spoken French should be considered polysynthetic. The point is that this provides an example of how polypersonal marking could arise, whether or not French's pronominal verbal markers are clitics or true affixes. Noun incorporation. Marianne Miffen, in the same article proposing a typology of noun incorporation, discusses pathways by which the process of noun incorporation can develop. At its most basic level, of course, noun incorporation is simply a compound composed of a noun root plus a verb root, and thus the development of noun incorporation is, in many ways, as simple as a language coming to permit noun-verb compounds as a productive process. Nonetheless, I'll note here a few ways in which some of the other common characteristics of noun incorporation can develop, and some examples of languages at various stages of developing productive noun incorporation. Firstly, Mithen notes a common tendency in many languages for verbs to coalesce with indefinite direct objects, and provides several Hungarian examples in which the referentiality and definiteness of the object affect the form of the predicate. Peter Olvasa's Ursago. Peter Olvas et Ursago. Peter Ursago Olvas. It's quite easy to see that we're well on the way here to true noun incorporation. When the object of a verb is not a clear, definite, referential object, but is rather indefinite and non-referential, and thus serving more as a modifier of the verb rather than an independent participant, it is more closely connected syntactically with the verb, which now lacks transitive marking. All that is needed to develop full noun incorporation is for such constructions to become lexicalized and to cease being merely a marker of definiteness. Lahu, a tibeto burman language, takes this a bit further. While the noun and verb remain distinct phonological words, in instances of incorporation, the two are more closely tied syntactically and have a difference in meaning from unincorporated examples. For instance, compare the following two examples. To drink the liquor in question, as opposed to drinking something else, or to drink liquor in general. Again, these remain two separate words, but we can see here that in the incorporated second example, the liquor is no longer marked as a direct object of the verb, but simply is acting to qualify the type of drinking involved. Apparently, children are reinterpreting such structures as unitary syntactic words. For example, while adults normally place the negative particle ma immediately before the verb, as in the first example, Children sometimes treat the noun-verb compound as a unity verb and place the negative particle before the entire complex, as in the second example. A similar case can be seen in some languages in Oceania. Take the following example from Mokalese. I'm grinding these coconuts. I'm coconut grinding. Note that while the verb and its incorporated object are still separate phonological words, in the incorporation manifest in the second example here, the verb and noun are syntactically bound to one another and behave as a single unit. In oceanic languages with this sort of incorporation, furthermore, the verbs generally involved behave as though they are intransitive. Recall that incorporation is generally a valence-reducing operation. The following example from Tongan can illustrate this well because Tongan is an ergative language. That is, the subject of transitive verbs, the ergative participant, is marked differently from both the subject of intransitive verbs and the object of transitive verbs, both of which are marked the same as one another as the absolutive participant. Na e no ae kava e sione. John drank the kava. Na e no kava a sione. John kava drank. Note how in the first sentence, without incorporation, the carver is marked as the absolutive, here the object of a transitive verb, with the preceding particle a, and John is marked as the subject of a transitive verb with the preceding ergative particle e. In the second sentence, with the syntactic, though not phonological, incorporation, John is now marked with the absolutive particle, and the carver is unmarked, thus indicating that the verb is now intransitive with John, now the subject of an intransitive rather than a transitive verb, marked as absolutive. Thus, we can see here several steps in the development of noun incorporation, from independent direct objects coalescing with a verb when they are indefinite and non-referential, to such nouns ceasing to be verbal arguments at all and becoming qualifiers of the verb. 
From here, we simply need phonological fusion of the verb and noun to have classic compounding and noun incorporation, of the kind described in section 4 of the previous video, Fireside Polysynthesis for Novices, part 1 of 2. Other affixes. I have a bit less to say on this topic. Partly this is because of the wide variety of things that fall under the umbrella of other affixes, but also because the origin of such other affixes are often very straightforward. In cases where there is evidence of their origin, they are normally derived from older compounding, either noun-verb compounds or verb-verb compounds. I'll provide a few examples here with the goal of providing a demonstration of some of the many possibilities open to you via the grammaticalization of older compounds. Instrumental affixes in numic. In many cases, the reconstructed protonomic instrumental affixes have clear similarities to reconstructed protonomic or proto uto aztecan independent noun or verb roots. Note that I don't know how current some of these reconstructions are, and they don't mark any of the germinating, spirantizing, etc. characteristics of numic morphemes. Ma with the hand, ta with the hand or grasping, ta with the foot, ku with the teeth, mu with the nose, Jo with the head or shoulder, go top or face, and su with mental activity. You pick post bases. Most post bases have no known connection to corresponding roots with similar meaning. However, there are a few post bases where the etymology seems clear, and the ultimate origin of most of the root post base combinations seems clearly to be from old compounds. A few post bases with identifiable sources are Tur, to eat or to use, from atur, to use. Charte, to hit in the body part, from acharte, to hit or slap with the hand. And myrte, injured or to be injured in the body part, from akmyrte, to hurt or get hurt. Spokane lexical affixes. Although most of the lexical suffixes in northwest coast languages have no obvious cognates and independent roots, there are several which do and which indicate that root plus lexical suffix combinations originated in compounds. The examples here are from Spokane, a Salishan language. This presentation glosses over the complex specifics of how exactly the lexical affixes are derived from independent roots. Essentially, roots that became lexical suffixes lost their initial consonant, and both roots and or suffixes could sometimes be reanalyzed as containing a connective affix used in compounds or the nominalizer s. Ene, ear or surface, from tene, ear. Ulich, ground, dirt or earth, from stulich, the same. Elich, person, from skalich. It's a, skin or hide, from sitzen, blanket. Che, urine, from che, to urinate. Skait, shoulder, from slakt, it is wide. A sickness from wait is sick. Aus conveyance or boat from sewish water. Asluk wood from luk stick of wood. Askul roaster from kul roast. Asshin knobbed object, rounded object, etc. From sense stone. Eps Buttock from thick and sin mouth food words language edge or shore from sin to hum or speak softly. It is fairly easy to determine the origins of a number of the coarse verbal affixes are described in the previous video. I'll discuss them in the order in which they were presented in the last video in section 5.5. The indefinite prefix art someone is connected to the independent noun arti person. As far as I can tell, its use as an indefinite prefix began with a form of incorporation, a process that can be easily seen in this prefix's use in nominalizations. Atasihka, policeman, literally person tire, from asihkan, to tie up. Atollo, a witch, literally a dangerous person, from hollon, to be dangerous. And atastahobajilka, a camera, literally people photographer from stahobachin to photograph. 
The directional and instrumental prefixes of slots 7 and 8 have their origin in earlier free verbs used in clause chains. The final T of all these prefixes was at one point the same subject marker. Muskogean languages have a switch reference system where basically verb suffixes identify, whether the following verb has the same subject or a different subject from the verb to which the suffix is appended. So, for example, the origin of the general instrumental prefix ist is in proto-Muskogean constructions involving the verb isi to take. For instance, isi tayan, to take and go, becomes stayan, to carry, i.e. to go with something. The directionals have similar origins. Oht, go and, is from proto-Muskogean onat, to arrive there and, from the verb ona, to reach. And it, come and, is from proto-Muskogean ilat, to arrive here and, from the verb ila, to come. A number of the specific locative prefixes can be seen to derive from older incorporated noun roots. Itta, action on the ground or in fire, may be connected to the Mikasuki noun iti, fire. O, action in water, is connected to the independent noun oki, water. Ba, action on a raised artificial or non-ground surface, is connected to the postposition bana, on top of. Ibi, action on the human face, seems to be related to the nouns ibi dala, face, ibi sani, nose, and ibi shikani, nasal mucus. Icho, action on the mouth, I presume, is derived from the proto muskogean noun ichoku, mouth, and nok, action on the human throat, is from the pr proto muskogean noun nok, meaning neck or throat. The ability suffix halpisa, probably derives from an earlier clause chain construction, as with the instrumental and directional prefixes. The chain would have had consisted of the main verb, with the suffix h, a subordinate connector, followed by a verb related to the modern verb stalpisan, to be enough. This form has the instrumental prefix st, so the original verb would have not had it and instead been alpisan. Where to go from here? So we've covered the basics of polysynthesis what it is, some of the many types of meaning and relations that can be marked on the verb in such languages, and some ways in which polysynthetic traits can develop. But where to go from here in developing your own polysynthetic language or in learning more about them? From personal experience, I can tell you the most effective thing is to learn a polysynthetic language. This takes a tremendous level of dedication and patience, so it's certainly not for everyone but it can provide you with so much more insight into some of the myriad possibilities open to you than reading a summary ever could. Failing that, simply reading grammars or grammatical sketches of polysynthetic languages would undoubtedly be helpful. There's been a good deal written about polysynthesis, and I've skipped over a lot of it, mostly due to having not read it all. I've glossed over the more theoretical stuff because I wanted this introduction to be basic, with the hope that it would be as accessible as realistically possible. In the meantime, the most significant theoretical work is Mark Baker's book, The Polysynthesis Parameter, and there have also been some good typologically oriented approaches to polysynthesis. I'd especially recommend two works by Miriam Mithun, her 1984 article on noun incorporation, and the book Languages of Native North America. And that's it. As usual, I thank my patrons, and as always, don't like and don't subscribe.